want this visitors thing off here? Uh, you can leave that on. Oh, that's. I will we'll probably get. Uh, it doesn't matter. Okay, let's see. This is um, July 17, 2001. We're interviewing Mr. Willard K. Holman at Latham headquarters. Michael Akey is the interviewer. Uh, Wayne Clark is the um, videographer. Uh, uh, Mr. Holman, where'd you, where'd you grow up? Medina, New York, on a farm. Uh huh. My parents were apple farmers. Apple farmers, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. how, how was uh, Medina back in uh, 19. Well, I graduated from high school in 1946. Okay. And uh, it, was a, it was a great experience growing up on the farm. And mm -hmm. Look back on it with many fond memories. <laughs> they weren't quite so fond then when you were working every day of the week, but uh, uh, they were fond memories. So you came out of high school and then what? Uh, went to Cornell and graduated in 1950. Mm -hmm. And then uh, went to work for, uh, now it's called Agway. It right. was GLF at that time. Oh. And I was there three months and got drafted. <laughs> And where'd you go to uh, basic? Uh, Fort Benning. Fort Benning. Mm -hmm. oh, what was that like? Uh, basic training was, uh, you asked what it was like, was it was calm compared to some of the other training I had. Mm -hmm. I thought it was pretty rough at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Is this your first time really away from home? No, four years at Cornell. Oh, okay. Four years at college. Okay. Yeah. But uh, if you graduate from college, you don't anticipate winding up peeling potatoes and <laughs> cleaning <laughs> grease traps in a, in a mess hall. <laughs> after um, after your uh, basic training, where, where did you go? Um, I signed up for OCS, and then mm -hmm. from there was transferred from Fort Benning to uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, to leadership school. Ah. And uh, then after leadership school, I was what they call pipeline for, for three months, signed the 82nd Airborne, and they, they had a, uh, and then from there I went to OCS mm -hmm. in Fort Sill. What was that like? That was rough. That was rough. <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> was rough. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, good experience, though. It was a good training for Yes. You? Okay. Yeah, I don't regret it at all. And uh, what were your thoughts about the, this uh, police action? It was a surprise. Um, really not many thoughts about it at the time, other than hoping you never get sent over there. It was called FECOM. Mm -hmm. You hope you never got sent to FECOM. But, um, I, hard to answer your question, uh, did what we're supposed to do, sure. and uh, never heard of the country before, and was lucky enough to come home alive, and frankly put it all behind me and never thought it just completely blocked it out, I guess you would say, mm -hmm. over the years until several years ago, then I started to do some study of it. Oh. And uh, so, <laughs> I don't know, it was, you know, it's all politics that we were involved with it. And uh, it's... Now, you're, um, you're in the 80s, you, you went to OCS, mm -hmm. and uh, you come out a, a nice, shiny second lieutenant. Yes. And uh, what was your assignment at that point? I went three months uh, troop duty to uh, Camp Rucker, Alabama. It's called, it's Fort Rucker now, Camp Rucker, Alabama. Mm -hmm. Three months troop duty, and then I was shipped over to Korea. What was uh, Alabama like? Hmm. A lot hot. different than the dining in New York. <laughs> yes, it, 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 just like Georgia, hot and muggy and a lot of bugs. <laughs> uh -huh. How are the people? Very nice. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, 
had a nice USO in town, and mm -hmm. it was a it was a uh, a nice town, Columbia, South Carolina. I spent a year there as a student at University of South Carolina. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Less than fond memories, but it's okay. <laughs> um, now, were you the 82nd at that point? No, I was only 82nd for three months okay. waiting to go go to a leadership school. Okay. Uh, what unit were you assigned to when you came out as a second lieutenant? What was I assigned to? Yes. Uh, 105 Battalion in uh, Camp Rucker. Mm -hmm. And then when I was shipped overseas, I was assigned to a 155 Archer Battalion. Oh, okay. As a... Uh, Did you three months as forward observer with the infantry? What was that experience like? Uh, Harry. <laughs> when I got there, um, uh, the 75th Field Artillery Battalion was a 155 millimeter mm -hmm. archer battalion, and it was part of what they call core artillery. Mm -hmm. It wasn't part of a division. It was assigned to whatever division was online in front of you. So mm -hmm. when I got there, it was the 9th Rock Infantry Division. So I did all my forward observer work with the with the Rock Infantry. Now, what was that? What was dealing with them like? Well, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. There. They're good people. Mm -hmm. uh, had, really had no problems, um, but uh, I didn't didn't expect that, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then then they rotated offline, and then another division came online. I believe it was the second. Mm -hmm. um, you was it easy dealing with the the Korean? Oh yeah, no. No, fine. No, they were easy to deal with. Mm -hmm. No problem. We had, in fact, we had what they call katusas in our battery. Oh, and, really? Yeah, yeah. And uh, they were good soldiers. Mm -hmm. They tried. Uh, no problems. Mm -hmm. So, um, what's uh, generally the the job of a forward observer, you're working with what, a radio man? Well, it's three, a wireman, a radio man, and a driver. Okay. The, and myself, and the forward observer is four people. And you man an outpost, and mm -hmm. uh, your job is to call fire, mm -hmm. or adjust fire, or observe fire. Uh, and when you see a target, you shoot on it. So you're generally at the sharp end of the stick. Yeah, at the point of the bayonet, it's sometimes called <laughs> the sharpest, and the stick is right. What time of the year? I got. Uh, I went on the OP uh, Christmas Day, 1952. I was the. I was a new meat in the organization. So. So what was that like, the new guy? Oh. Uh, well, you were discriminated against. I guess is the best way of saying it. Well, you, you had to prove yourself, I guess okay. is the way of saying it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, how long was that, did that process take? It only took one shelling <laughs> to prove yourself. <laughs> as long as you were still there? As long as you were still there, it took one. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, uh, being a forward observer is pretty tough duty. It is. It can be very dangerous. Particularly those who have to go on patrol mm -hmm. and patrol out into the MLR or beyond the MLR into what we call, they call it no man's land, mm -hmm. and a man a listening post. So you're in Korea in 50... 52. 52. December. So, uh, and who's in front of you? Uh, Chinese. The Chinese. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, You've gone basically from Alabama to Korea in the winter. Yes. That must have been uh, a change. Yeah, the winters are terribly cold. Mm -hmm. They really are. How was your equipment? Oh, good. We had good, good equipment. We weren't like the poor guys that got there early on. They had no um, cold weather gear. Mm -hmm. uh, they, those guys really suffered unbelievably. I, I don't know how they did it. Mm -hmm. Just with stories that I've read. Of course, this is what I've read since I started 
reading some of the history, what these poor guys really suffered with, you know, the fatigue, just the fatigue jackets and. Now you're with the what? The, is it the four? What corps were you attached to? Um, Ninth Corps. Ninth Corps. Ninth Corps. And commanding officer. At the time, I don't remember his okay. name. Okay. Um, were you on the offensive at that point, or had yes. you? Yes. Oh, well, it was the trench warfare. Okay. Uh, the, the offensive, and I guess you'd say no huge offensive where they were moving backwards and forwards. It was all trench warfare, but uh, of course our side was always attacking their hills and mm -hmm. trying to take them and then they, so there was active combat, but mm -hmm. it was confined to trench warfare. So what was it like living uh, in the hills? Dirty. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing I remember the most about being in Korea, being cold and dirty. <laughs> uh, how often, how long were you in, in line? Well, it was three months uh, as an observer. Mm -hmm. And then for two and a half months, I volunteered to go up on the MLR with the two howitzers, a platoon of howitzers to fire destruction missions and firing on caves, trench lines, um, fortifications. So I spent almost two and a half months up on the MLR with two howitzers firing destruction missions yeah. after the, the three months on the OP. Now what exactly is a destruction mission? Well, just blowing up a cave, mm -hmm. you know, uh, not completely direct fire because you still can't see the target, but mm -hmm. you're so close that uh, you just keep firing until you, until you hit it, mm -hmm. uh, and... Uh, How do you acquire targets in that type of... Uh, acquire target? Oh, the, the observers that are on the line okay. uh, send them back to the battalion, and the battalion assigns the coordinates, and they give, gave me the coordinates, and mm -hmm. uh, then the observer sights it in, or senses the rounds, so mm -hmm. we get a target hit. So I did that for two and a half months, and that was... <clears throat> Harry. <laughs> Why was that? Uh, because of your proximity? Yes, yes. Okay. So you had a section of gun? Two. Two howitzers. Two howitzers. That's a, there are two sections. A section is one howitzer in, order oh, okay. in, in artillery okay. uh, terminology. Um, so you're there a couple of months? Mm -hmm. And um, what's your general impression of that experience? Well, I really became, a, I think, a, a good fire direction officer because mm -hmm. I actually had my own fire direction center. Mm -hmm. They gave the they, they gave the coordinates to to this to my group, mm -hmm. and then we did all of the computations for for the observer, mm -hmm. which are ordinarily done at a battalion, huh? and. Uh, the battalion assigned me the, mm -hmm. the, the job, so to speak, but we fired it. Mm -hmm. We computed it and everything. Mm -hmm. So it was a mini fire direction center, which is quite a uh, work of art. Mm -hmm. It's all changed today. I don't know what they do today. but uh, are all computers. Yeah. Amazing. Um, what type of infantry support did you have? Because if you're up that close, well, you, you mean the outfit, or how good were they? Or? Well, uh, both. Um, well, they were very good because they, nobody ever got through them. <laughs> uh, was infiltration a big problem? Uh, I think so. I, I, I think it was a problem. Um, I never had any where I was. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was, particularly early on, in, in the war it was, but I, I'm s s really treading on thin ice. I'm not that familiar with what went on in other places. All I know is right where I was. That's okay. That's 
that's the war, and we had no infiltration where I was. Okay. But I heard it hadn't been a problem. Okay. Uh, any major attacks while you were? Well, toward the end of the war, uh, toward just before the armistice was signed, there was um, a lot of firing going on. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the targets were, but it was in the central front. I was located in the central front in the Kumwa Valley. Mm -hmm. And, and in fact, the forward guns that I was command of was almost at the junction of the road in what used to be the town of Kumwa. Mm. And uh, <clears throat> so that's where I was located, is in, in, in Kumwa, mm -hmm. in uh, Central Front. And the, the tax usually came in in that area, and the other area that was hotly contested was Chorwan, Chorwan Valley. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, let's see, you, had, it's, you spent a couple of months up forward uh, with two howitzers. Uh, then did you go back on any R&R? &R? Well, I went on R&R, &R, yes. I was in five days in Japan, Tokyo. Oh, how was that? Wild. I <laughs> had <laughs> great time. <laughs> Bought some. Uh, oh, uh, dinnerware, china for our, for my wife and I, oh, and um, we weren't married at the time, but we had plans of it. Mm -hmm. Drank a lot of beer. <laughs> Ate some good steaks. Mm -hmm. How was the food uh, in, in in country? Ja in Japan? Yeah, well, in, in Korea. Oh, of course. A lot of it was C rations, mm -hmm. and the other ones were B rations back in the Battery area. They were they were good. I you know it was better than C rations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hot meals. Hot meals. Okay. And occasionally get a hot meal up, brought up to me, up uh, with the forward guns. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you you proved yourself pretty quickly. Yes. Okay. You were fairly well accepted. Yes. Right. Yep. Um, and let's see, what um, what were the men under you like? A pretty good group. Yes, they were. Yeah, had no problems with them at all. I don't know if they had problems with me or not, but I I had no. They were a good bunch of guys. They're all draftees. They were uh, they had a job to do, and they said, "Well, let's do it and get it over with." And as long as you had that same attitude, uh, mm -hmm. I think they respected that. Well, what was it like, uh, the relationship between draftees and regulars? I never saw too much. Um, nothing really mm -hmm. comes to my mind uh, between the two. No, mm -hmm. no, not at all. Now, did you move around much? No. no. No, it stayed in the same spot for the whole time I was there. Really? Yeah, never moved. What was that like? Uh, well, you have to know the countryside pretty well. No, no, not really. Uh, never left the better area other than to go to the OP or to go up to the uh, forward guns. Or, and occasionally we'd run a truck back to Sewell on Sunday, a pass truck, and I'd mm -hmm. volunteer to go down with that. They needed an officer in charge, mm -hmm. and uh, and to go on R and R. That's the only time that I ever left the area. Oh. Yeah, never, never left the area. So what was Seoul like? Uh, the well was devastated. Really, mm -hmm. it was, it was, really bombed out. I mm -hmm. mean. It, uh, did you have much um, contact with the uh, natives? No. no. The only contact we had native was we had a couple of houseboys, a couple mm -hmm. of Korean young guys. That's really my only contact with with them, other than than the, the rocks and the infantry division. Mm -hmm. The um, what did you think of MacArthur? Oh, well, I had. No opinions at that time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, 
at that time, uh, to be honest with you, I never really thought about it. Okay. okay. You were just thinking about trying to get your guys and yourself home in one piece. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how other people viewed their combat experience, but that was mine. I thought that was my job was to make certain that the guys that I was responsible for it got home and I did too. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you made first lieutenant? No, I wasn't there long enough to make first lieutenant. Okay, so you were in, you were in uh, Korea for what, about a year? No, I was only there uh, from basically uh, December to October. Okay. I didn't have enough time in grade to make first lieutenant because the war had ended mm -hmm. and they froze all promotions mm -hmm. and I was just about about a week <laughs> short. <laughs> the, um, the static warfare, they ended up seeing the same piece of real estate day after day after day, they, uh, that did boring? Or? Yeah, long periods of monotony in real short periods of terror. You summed up most of warfare. Yeah, that's. Now was the uh, Chinese artillery active? Yes. Were they any good? Yes. Um, yeah, they well, they shelled us all the time. Uh, off, was there counter battery fire very often? Well, that's what we were doing. We were we were firing on them in okay. a counter battery. Okay. And we fired all kinds of concentrations at night. Uh, what they call concentrations, they, every hour or so you have to fire a battery two rounds at certain elevations, certain deflections. Mm -hmm. And my forward guns where I was, I we had to fire some concentrations too at, at night. Mm -hmm. But during the daytime, of course that's a considered counter battery I guess, and of course during the daytime we fired on any targets that the observers mm -hmm. came up with. We had air L-19 air observer planes, oh. and they spotted targets during the day. Were they pretty effective? Very. Mm -hmm. Did you ever go up? In OCS, you had to fly once. Okay. I never did. I put, had my name on the list, but the list was so long. Really? Everybody wanted to get in them. Oh. oh, yeah, everybody wanted that job because you were back about 10 miles, and you had uh, hot chow all the time. You had uh, uh, cot with sheets showers and everything else, of course. That's a big, slow target, though. It's kind of dangerous, yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> One of the guys I knew, he, he was my upperclassman in OCS, and uh, he was the air, air observer when I was had these forward guns. Mm -hmm. And uh, this guy used to give me a terrible hard time <laughs> in, in OCS and here, you know, and fire and fire missions for him. <laughs> Um, you uh, you practice time on target at all? Uh, time on target is is usually I don't know who usually sets it up, but it usually comes from I think from core. Right. And I observed once. Okay. One, and it, it it really is impressive, I'll tell you. How do yeah how, yeah, how does it feel to have that much firepower? Under your it's, it's like it's like no other fireworks display you'll ever see, <laughs> or I'll ever see. It's just incredible. It, incredible. I don't know what the target was, but uh, it was in front of me when I was an observer. Mm -hmm. I was told to observe it. Didn't even have to be told. <laughs> Gosh sakes. What a what Under a show. Display, eh? Yes. Yeah. Um, a friend of mine was a Ford observer in Korea. Was he? Yeah. Also, World War Two. And, uh, and was he 105s or 155s? Um, it was mainly 105s. Yeah, early on in the war. Well, that it, you know, that's I was very fortunate I that I went over when I did because um, I don't minimize <laughs> the combat that I was in, but those guys early on, they really had it tough. I mean. Yeah. The fluid, you asked about infiltration, mm -hmm. that's 
where the infiltration was. You'd set up at night and, you know, the enemy would come through, sneak in, and, oh, just terror. Mm -hmm. Absolute terror. Do you, did you often get to see the enemy or did it just... Uh, to be honest with you, I only saw maybe two mm -hmm. in all the time I was there. Oh. Now, all my fire was uh, uh, given to me uh, to, they, they would say that there was troop concentrations in an area mm -hmm. and I would adjust right. on it. And, uh, but I did see some, unfortunately I did see a few people hit. Mm -hmm. But usually, see, <laughs> it's all at night, you yeah. really don't know. This was daytime fire, which was a rare, to me was a rarity. Really? Yeah. Most of the most of the fire you were involved in was it, at night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, that's when they're active. Mm -hmm. No. And they're attacking. Okay. Yeah. Um, see, you, our artillery is usually considered unobserved fire. When you start to see the enemy in front of you, that's your infantry. You're not <laughs> artillery anymore. Fuck, <laughs> are you having a bad day? Yeah. Right. Um, uh, so, what are your general impressions of your service? Well, uh, it was uh, I'm privileged to have been able to do it. I, you know, like everyone else, and I say this most sincerely. It's, it's a, it's an honor to serve your country, um, and I became a better. I think I became a better person as a result of it, and I decided that I would never give up on anything, and mm -hmm. I would always try to see things through. But uh, if I had had the choice. I think I would have rather put in three years in something like the Peace Corps. <laughs> what was uh, generally the morale uh, like um, while you were in the, in the front lines? Very good. Very good? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Spree de Corps was pretty yeah. high? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, artillerymen are generally cut above. They, they were, yeah. And the, and the infantry troops that I saw too, they were, they were, mm -hmm. uh, the Spree de Corps, they, I saw very little negative, mm -hmm. negative attitude. Mm -hmm. uh, good you question, I never had anybody ask me that before. <laughs> you, um, how do you view the Korean War now? Do you think it was an ignored, that the history has ignored it? They have, but it's changing. Mm -hmm. People are starting to hear about it, read about it, and realize the importance of it. What was it like when you came home? Like, where you been? <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah, where you been? I haven't <laughs> seen you in a while. And that was... Yeah. That was pretty much, pretty much the attitude. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> How did you feel about that attitude? Now, for you, you were involved in a life and death struggle. Yeah. And, uh, you come home and oh, haven't seen you around. Oh, it's hurt. Really? Yes. <clears throat> um, I generally kept my mouth shut. Because how are you going to explain it to anybody? They, Unless you've been there, it's mm -hmm. how you describe it. Do <coughs> you feel um, the country, the government, let you down? No. No. Just, it just didn't have an impact on most people, so. Yeah. No, I don't. I don't think the government did. The. Uh, I wonder about it ever being fought in the first place. And, 
to him. So it, it did serve a purpose. Mm -hmm. did, now, when you got out, um, did you go into the reserves at all? Or? Uh, I was in the inactive reserves, and they, uh, I got out of them as soon as I could. <laughs> 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 and uh, after the war, what did uh, what did you went out get on with your life? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Immediately uh, upon getting out, what did you do? Well, I got out in November of 1953, and then uh, we were married. I started my job as a I'm an entomologist, somewhat by training at Cornell, so I sold farm chemicals mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> to farmers for insect and disease control and then we were married in July of 1954, mm -hmm. 47 years ago today. That's this the anniversary. Is, this is our anniversary. And, well, uh, thanks for coming in. Yeah, and uh, put it all behind me. I you know, just uh, went on. <laughs> All right, but I, now you're starting to think about what yeah. what brought you to the point that let me reconsider this or let me think about this. What anything in particular influenced that thinking? Well, this, I guess the idea that it's sort of considered the forgotten war. Mm -hmm. Then I started collecting books, uh, doing a lot of reading building up a, a small library and uh, started thinking about it a little bit and what and I hadn't in all these years and uh, the things that happened along the way are made me begin to wonder I you know I I'm treading on thin ice here, maybe, but no, I... No, not at all. Because um, I'd have to do a lot of homework to, to, to substantiate this, but this sort of comes to mind. I think we really got involved with the Korean War by uh, Truman's and that administration, particularly Dean Axon, when he made a speech before the UN, said that Korea was outside of the sphere, sphere of influence of the United States. Changed their mind, didn't it? Yeah. And of course they were concentrating all their effort again in the Cold War mm -hmm. in Europe. And uh, I guess according to some of the historians and everything, of course hindsight is great, you know, that uh, Gave the people in the China, Russia, wherever is involved, um, the idea that the U.S. would not get involved. And of course, the minute that, that the North Koreans attacked, why we went in immediately. So that's where my change. In all started, I guess, through all this, this reading. And, uh, however, I, I do feel that the, it uh, was important from the standpoint that it did stem communism. But there are some people who think, well, maybe it would have happened anyway. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, I just think of all of the all of the lost productivity, all of the, the lies, all the doctors, the lawyers, teachers, scientists, who knows that they were suddenly stopped when they were 18, 19 years old. And I wonder where, I suppose this is with all wars, where we would be productive productivity-wise, uh, uh, lifestyle-wise, and so forth. And, uh, and not only U.S., but the other countries. Think, think of all the Koreans that died. There are millions of them. 
in the Chinese. <laughs> That's interesting. But, and the Chinese, of course, the hordes that they sent over there, the reading that I'd done, these were all peasants. Mm -hmm. Poor guys, they didn't. You know, they were just did what they were told. Herded in. Mm -hmm. Some of them didn't even have weapons, I guess, as I some of the readings that I've read. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, brought you to this point. Yeah. Any final thoughts? No, I, not really, except that I'm going to Korea on a revisit tour. Great. And uh, just made the arrangements. Had thought about it and decided that we would go. Main reason we're going, one, one of the things that helped was the fact that my wife has a niece that lives in Tokyo, mm -hmm. so we have a chance to visit. Mm -hmm. And one other thing I think it, to me is quite ironic is that our daughter, one of our daughters, <clears throat> just adopted a Chinese girl a year ago. She was 10 months old when she got her. Mm -hmm. She's now a little over two. So she went to China to pick up a little girl. And uh, I've said a couple of times, you know, I wonder 50 years ago if her grandfather and I might have been shooting at each other. <laughs> Very good possibility. <laughs> so, I find that ironic. Well, thank you very much. This yes. It's been very good. Uh, I've enjoyed it. Well, I have too.